Um, but thank you very much for inviting me. Um, Space Logistics LLC is a Northrop Grumman company, and we are now five years of on-orbit servicing of experience, three years with our Mission Extension Vehicle 1 and two years with Mission Extension 2. So while many people are uh, building and planning for the future, we already have now five years of service in orbit service, and it's continuing day every day. Another uh, day goes by, we keep building up more experience in space. So um, I didn't get to join in the last conference too much. I was listening to the last panel. It was a very interesting discussion. I wish I'd got on a little sooner to listen to those panels, but. Um, we're we're going to be sharing a recording with you as well, Thomas, after the event, so you, you, Perfect. you, you, can, you can experience it fully. Um, as I was saying, uh, life extension services, we've now been providing five years of life extension service to two satellites for Intelsat. Um, the satellites are very healthy, providing good service to their customers and generating revenue for Intelsat. So Intelsat is very pleased with the service. Um, and we've been very pleased with providing the service to them, of course. Um, in 2024, we are going to be launching our robotic satellite uh, vehicle to start robotic satellite servicing in orbit. I can say I was in the factory this past week giving a tour to a prospective customer, and the uh, robotic arm module, it looks like it's complete. There's a couple testings they're doing. Uh, we're going to start doing the integration of the robotic arms from DARPA or with DARPA um, onto that platform. And the uh, Geostar 3 bus, I understand, is on its way from our Southern California location to our factory in Dulles to start the integration of the, uh, the, the satellite bus for the robotic satellite. Um, so exciting times coming. We're preparing for a launch in 2024, um, and we'll also be launching the first three of our mission extension pods uh, for customers that have contracted with us for those mission extension pods to extend the life of their satellites uh, station keeping. Um, in 2025, uh, we're also going to uh, be starting our capability of refueling um, and geoactive debris removal with our mission robotic vehicle. Our uh, mission robotic vehicle will have a passive refueling port. Uh, we won't need fuel in 2025, but it's the capability will be there um, by having it. We'll also have the capability of doing removal of debris uh, in the geo arc. Um, there's not, there is debris up there, but there's not too much, but we will be uh, uh, actively discussing with customers about moving, removing debris from their orbital slots. And then in 20, 2030, as part of the Northrop Grumman plan, we hope to support their in-orbit assembly and manufacturing plans, along with other uh, plans that Northrop Grumman has. We may be launching additional mission robotic vehicles by 2030. Uh, if we were to support everything that Northrop Grumman has planned, uh, we will have to have mission robotic vehicles in a number of orbits to support them. So uh, moving forward, going very well from our company. Um, I had already talked about on this one here a little bit about MEV-1 and MEV-2, which have been in, in service now for a cumulative of about five years. And the mission robotic vehicle, I gave you the status that it's in construction. The first three MEPs are in construction on our Gilbert, Arizona factory. Um, those are under construction for launch in 2024 also. Um, and this is really the uh, next generation of our services, trying to make it um, more economical for geosatellite operators to consider extending the life of their satellites. And later I'm gonna go through a, a, a why. Why would they wanna do this? But um, some of it's in there, uh, value proposition, deferral of CapEx. Um, I just wanna say that in the bottom right there, it's, it's deferral of CapEx in these uncertain times as Leo constellations and Mio constellations, some of the geo operators are trying to determine 
is it good to buy a brand new geo satellite? Is there going to be a market for 15 to 20 years for, for them? Uh, with extending the life of the existing assets for four or five years, six years, they can really see is the market really deteriorating or will it continue to expand and grow? Um, they can also use the MEPs to start um, exploring new marketplaces by relocating a, a, a satellite and seeing if they can uh, generate revenue at a new orbital slot. Uh, capitalizing on old assets, I would put that in the more in the category of still revenue continuity. Seeing as a satellite is um, near its end of its life, why not see if you can use more, spend about 25% of the cost of a new satellite and get 33% uh, extra life on the satellite. So it's a good value. Anomaly attribute attribution, I really put that in the category of what if you had something, uh, it's really launch vehicle redundancy restoration. Say if uh, you have a partial failure of your station keeping system, the MEP can come in and augment that uh, station keeping capability and resolve an anomaly. Um, the other is, is anomaly from a launch vehicle. Uh, it, it does happen occasionally that a launch vehicle does not get it into the proper orbit. Uh, and a lot of times geosatellite operators are wrestling with, do they use the on-orbit fuel to make up for that difference, knowing that they're going to lose years of service? With an MEP, they can restore the life expectancy of that satellite uh, back to what its original business plan was, so they can try to recapture their investment. Very important for geo operators. Uh, revitalization, this would be more as there's some discussions about being able to augment the uh, spacecraft, adding new uh, capabilities to it. Um, think of adding a payload on the mission extension pod as it's attached to the spacecraft, where actually could add a payload to the spacecraft uh, by putting it on the mission extension pod. Um, a lot of customers are looking at the possibilities of adding payloads onto the satellite and until this new capability, once you once it goes into the payload fairing on the launch vehicle, it's done. It can't really change the spacecraft once it's launched into space. Yes, there's software defined payloads coming, um, but the ability to actually add a different antenna, maybe a different frequency is very challenging to do in space. So just watching to see if any questions after comments like that and whether I'm going too fast for it, you no, you were going just fine, Thomas. Okay, I know that I had about a 30 minute window, so I wanted to make sure I stay within it. So sure. um, when I was talking about the new satellite servicing, which is the mission extension pod, that's what you see in the center. On the left is the, uh, the mission robotic vehicle. You can mostly just see the mission robotic vehicle module that's under construction right now at our Dulles facility that I just saw this past week. The robotic arms are just finishing up their uh, thermal vac testing by DARPA. I think they've actually passed all their testing for the robotic arms, and we're looking to start getting them integrated in the next two months, three months, onto our robotic module. Uh, and then it'll come back to our Dulles campus uh, to be integrated onto a Geostar 3 satellite. Um, we've announced the first customer, which is to Optus. And the next two MEPs have not been announced yet. We hope to announce them soon uh, once we get everything finished with that customer. Um, but the first three are all sold. Uh, we're actually in negotiations for number four and it should continue growing as the customers see the value of a mission extension pod. We're getting more and more interest in mission extension pods and providing these to customers in the future. Um, if you want to see more, you can go out to our website and actually see a nice um, computer generated video on the mission extension vehicle and the mission ro robotic vehicle. So uh, what is a mission extension pod? Well, it has a couple of features and functions. The, the big thing is that it is a propulsion augmentation system. It has its own solar arrays, its own batteries, its own uh, 
electric propulsion system. Uh, it has its own attitude control um, when it's in free flyer before it's attached to a customer. We're looking into its ability to supplement attitude control on spacecraft. It's really a matter of uh, size differential. Uh, the MEP's mass is only about 300, 350 kilograms in space. So a 350 kilogram vehicle doesn't move a 3,000, 4,000 kilogram spacecraft that easily in space, moving it around. Uh, it has its own TTNC. It has its encryption for telemetry and commanding. Um, and then there is, we have added, as we're going through a lot of our internal discussions and meetings, we've added a camera for a single imager for alignment, making sure we're aligned when the mission robotic vehicle is going to dock the MEP to the spacecraft. We don't really want the docking mechanism. Uh, I'm gonna say, we don't want it sliding down the nozzle of the uh, LAE nozzle. We'd really like to line it up as best we can so that it goes in, deploys its toggle switches and attaches. Um, and that way we can also un undock it later if it needs to be. We, we mostly see most of our customers are expecting to leave the MEP on the spacecraft for the duration of their, their spacecraft. Um, and I should add on here that just to make sure pointing out that what we acronym is CV is client vehicle. Another word is it's just the commercial satellite vehicle or whatever space vehicle we're connecting to. It doesn't need to be commercial. It could be a government satellite. Um, as long as they have an LE nozzle, we can um, provide propulsion augmentation to that spacecraft in, in space. So that's what I was going to explain on that. So you can see it's, uh, the, I don't know if I can put an arrow out here, but uh, you have that one extent boom arm extension. We call it the atom. And at the end of that, that's where the actual um, ion thrusters are at the end. And it swivels around so that we can, uh, uh, we can optimize the thrust vectors and thrust angles when doing uh, station keeping for the customer. And I say we, the customer is actually flying this. It becomes part of their spacecraft and they're really just sending the commands for it to align and give optimum thrust for their station keeping. So I see one coming up in the chat questions. Uh, Nicholas, anything I need to add before going too farther on in case I have to go back? Uh, no, so oh, you, you, you can continue no, and, and, and I have some questions for you also uh, at the end that I will ask and there's going to be some more questions from the attendees as well. Oh, no problem. You, no you, problem. you can just uh, carry out, finish the presentation first. And, All right, and so this picture gives a nice uh, computer generated uh, visual of the, uh, the RSGS payload. And we, what we would use as all the uh, radar, LIDAR, and visual uh, capabilities for being able to do uh, rendezvous proximity operation and docking of an MEP to the spacecraft. Now, so the, the robotic vehicle will actually capture the MEP uh, in the customer's orbital slot and we'll then actually dock it to the spacecraft. Um, we don't have the MEP do, having all the uh, instrumentation to do RPOD operations. We have that all on the mission robotic vehicle to do that. Um, the mission robotic vehicle has both C-band and S-band communications for, for telemetry. And then there's a list of all the cameras that we have on there. The one thing is we don't have is a really high resolution camera. We have to get in relatively close to a spacecraft to take pictures and take uh, radar imagery of it. This is not something we would do from kilometers away. It, we, it's really best for us to come down within 100, 100 meters, even 10 meters. We can build a really good 3D image and camera pictures and documentation of a spacecraft when we're coming to inspect any type of potential repair uh, of a spacecraft, we wanna come in and be able to get a very good high resolution picture then of it and radar so we can provide that to the original manufacturer of the spacecraft so they can determine what actions to be taken to potentially repair a spacecraft. We won't determine that, we'll work with the, the, the customer and the spacecraft manufacturer that designed and built the spacecraft. 
Okay. Let me go on to the next slide. This is a major question. Let me just see going down here. So uh, this was just to try to get a give a overall. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis work. We're we've completed our CDRs uh, both for the MEP and the MRV and the mission operation of the mission robotic vehicle with the MEPs. That's why we started construction. Um, but during that CDR evaluations, we also then evaluated um, bus structures and we're highly confident of all of these spacecraft that the MEP would be able to support them and provide us propulsion augmentation for those spacecraft just the way they were designed without any modification of the spacecraft in orbit. We're not doing any type of surgery or changing anything. We're just going to dock to it, to a spacecraft that wasn't designed to be docked. That's the beauty of our design of our, um, of our system, the way we've designed it, is to dock with something that was not designed to be docked to. Um, but we've gone through is, an, if I don't say, I put just the, spacecraft bus, I should have put the manufacturer. So an A2100 is a Lockheed Martin satellite. The BSS-702 is a Boeing uh, satellite. DS-2000 is a Melco satellite. FS-1300 and FS-1300 short and tall are Maxar satellites. E-3000 is Airbus satellites. Space bus B and space bus C is Talus Alenia space. And Geostar 2 and Geostar 3 are Northrop Grumman built satellites. So, is there any questions? I think that was actually the end of my slides. I was trying to keep it, um, yep, keep it to a point where I'd have a lot of room for questions for you, Nicholas. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, I've got quite some, some of those so for you. Uh, so, uh, again, now with the, uh, on the previous panel, we had discussion and there was over 107,000, again, satellites. Uh, that the individuals discussed uh, will be put out into orbit over the next decade, right? Which is a very big number if, if, if we keep in the current space debris environment in mind, right? Yes. Uh, with, the, with the Kessler syndrome almost almost here and in, in its solution, initial phases. So uh, how do you see, again, this? Uh, obviously, it's very important how the uh, life extension and recycling is very important topic, and it's a great job that your company is doing, uh, Thomas. So... Uh, but how uh, scalable will be that in numbers? So, so if you mean well, uh, what I mean by the question, because uh, as I see you working on a specific satellites of specific companies, but it's not really, uh, you know, technically feasible to conduct those operations on hundreds of satellites, you know, over a short yeah, period. Well, well, the the thing about one hundred and seven thousand or whatever number it's going to be, I mean, it's already growing fast. Most of those spacecraft are at LEO. So in LEO, you have different altitudes, different inclinations, different velocities. In order to do anything in the LEO market, you have to launch a debris recovery system to each altitude, each uh, inclination, and each velocity. You can't just capture something that's going 10,000 miles an hour the wrong direction and reach out with a robotic arm because it'll tear it right off the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So you have to, all that debris, you're going to have to match the velocity, altitude, and inclination. Um, the biggest part I'm more worried about is getting to the geo arc with all that and the Kessler potential of it's probably when it's going to happen, not if it's going to happen. Actually, we had the individual from European Space Agency, and he said that it already began, uh, according to their data. So if that's in its progress, how are you going to launch things through that mess to get satellites to geo? That's, I mean, you you deploy the payload fairings as you get into the up, you know, upper atmosphere when you get, um, since I was in the launch business for most, for half of my career, um, you deploy the payload fairing very early, so there's no protection for the spacecraft. Launching through that debris, it's just going to be random luck to get a geo satellite through that mess uh, in the future, if this really occurs. So orbit debris at LEO is very, very challenging. And the real thing is who's going to pay for it? Because you think about the LEO operators, those satellites, are they cost less than $2 million each. So who wants to recover a $2 million satellite 
collect it, fix it, repair it, do anything to it. It is debris. Um, and I know they have now this um, requirements to deorbit. It was 25 years. Now, now it's five, I think, right? Now it's five years. Um, yes. But I can tell you, I was with Orbcom uh, launching back in the 90s. And the one thing we found at 500, 550 kilometers up, uh, 550 nautical miles up, there is still atmosphere up there, but the drag ratio is much lower than everybody thinks. And when when of that debris, are we going to have to wait 50 years for that whole Leo constellation to come down so we can launch new geo satellites? I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, I think taxpayers around the world are going to have to pay for that Leo debris cl cleanup. Uh, mm -hmm. Companies yeah. are not going to be interested in paying to clean it up. Yeah, that, that that's a yeah, that's an interesting point. Actually, we had the space debris panel as well on the on the first day, uh, March 16 of the conference, uh, and and one of the individuals uh, who was the president of the Portuguese space agency, uh, Ricardo Conde. So he he brought up a point that he believes that the one of the realistic and the only ways, as he described it, was to uh, impose some sort of a tax on the companies, uh, on the operators. Uh, there would be some sort of a function uh, of, uh, again, the amount of the satellites that they have in orbit uh, and uh, their annual revenue. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that, that, what challenges do you see with that? And I how, how realistic I, is that that companies will be okay with that? So I don't uh, know what the answer is to it. I'm going to tell you, I don't know. I, yeah. I do know that when it becomes a big mess up there, it's going to cause a lot of challenges to everybody. Because the LEO operators are going to want to launch replacements at different altitudes. Mm -hmm. and so instead of launching at 500, 700, 1,000, they're going to want to get up to 2,000 or 3,000 kilometers up. Um, and then they're going to start approaching because you see companies wanting to launch to MEO orbits and all that and be above that LEO uh, one. And you know, then don't even forget about all the government satellites that are up there that have to be they're going to have to work about all this debris too. So I don't know what the answer is. I'm going to tell you, at the geo world, I can just know at the geo world, it's where there's high valued assets. Mm -hmm. Satellites that cost 200, 300, 400 million dollars to get on orbit. Those operators <laughs> are very concerned about their investments on those assets and would like to extend the life or repair those satellites. And if there's debris near their spacecraft, they're willing to pay for having that debris removed from their orbital slot from them. Um, so that's where we're at. We're at the high, we're going after the high asset marketplace. Um, I applaud OneWeb of putting the, um, the magnetic uh, pad on each one of their LEO satellites for looking into the future, for potentially being able to have magnetic connection to grasp OneWeb spacecraft. I've seen Starlink uh, satellites in the factory there at SpaceX. I didn't see a metal plate or something, what their plan is, but their plan is just to deorbit, to have enough fuel to deorbit those spacecraft. So each of them have plans, and I sure hope they've planned well. That's all I can say. I don't know the answer, though, to it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And, and going into the future and now with the emergence of the, again, lunar activities and the lunar economy, uh, would, again, this uh, life extension and recycling operations be also applicable to the cislunar orbit? Oh, absolutely. Not only cislunar, also Mars orbits. So we've been looking at both uh, cislunar, we've been looking at translunar, we've been looking at Mars orbits. There's some expensive assets flying around Mars right now that are very hard to replace or service. So uh, again, we're looking at where's those high valued assets. And that's where customers want to extend the life of or have any type of anomaly resolution or anything that we can potentially do. The, the only issue with Mars so far, the analysis there, it's, it's many different orbits. There's no one standardized orbit. Mm -hmm. So you got people in all sorts of inclinations, different velocities inclinations. And so you have to kind of match those orbits. The problem with is that is you have to use fuel to change from one orbit to another or inclination, and then you end up using all your fuel and then you become a debris. That's what you got to make sure you don't become as a debris up there. So we're looking at all of those orbits. Definitely need to keep the, the orbits around the moon and Mars clean if we're going to have communications around those assets 
if we're going to have moon base and a uh, Mars base, they're going to need standardized communications. Everybody's still going to want to have their uh, Wi-Fi connections on the moon and Mars, um, and they're going to be very valuable assets orbiting those. And yes, we would look to uh, servicing those assets. Perfect. And wonderful. You can see Northrop Grumman's very uh, enthusiastic about Cislunar. We have a number of programs with it. Good. Uh, and we also have a lot of Mars programs also. So we are definitely in line with Northrop Grumman's aspirations. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you again for supporting those uh, long distance and again, uh, really exploratory missions and, and uh, you know, really looking forward and outward of the Earth as well, uh, and not just only in Leo and Krampen, again, those orbits that we currently already have overpopulated. Yeah. Uh, so, so so, my next question is, uh, Thomas, so uh, what are some of the, uh, again, technical difficulties with ensuring that those operations of recycling and, again, um, you know, life extension does not interfere with the active and operational and functional uh, spacecraft? Well, uh, so one of the things... When we're docking something, we do a lot of analysis work to make sure where the center of gravity is, where the change of center of gravity, what all of the safeguards on the spacecraft, because spacecraft have safeguards uh, for accuracy pointing to make sure that communications to the earth and back are operational and, and optimized. So we do a lot of analysis work with each spacecraft manufacturer manufacturer making sure when we augment the propulsion system that we're compatible with those spacecraft. It's very important you don't just plug in something on the back of a satellite and expect for the uh, satellite to accept it. Um, there's parameters on the operations of those geo satellites that have to be tuned. A lot of them have some margins in those, but all of those we have to work out with each spacecraft manufacturer. And as to recycling, I mean, that's what we're definitely promoting. Instead of putting those geosatellites into graveyard orbit and adding another geosatellite into graveyard orbit, why not recycle it and use it? It's the ultimate thing of deferring putting another asset in space. Um, we have customers with a mission extension pod that can get, based on their, their mass, upwards to 10 additional years off a mission extension pod. We designed it optimal for a 2000 mass spacecraft to get about six additional years of life. And that 2000 kilogram mass is the dry mass plus any residual fuel on board. Um, and there's quite a lot of satellites up there in space that we'd like to recycle and continue service. Um, however, it's always things about uh, making sure that the electronics are working, the solar arrays, transponders. Uh, I was talking to a customer that if they had more of their uh, tubes still operational, they would love to extend the life of the satellite, but they've had some on-orbit failures of the uh, communication tubes that generate transponders. So if you don't have fully redundant transponders, customers are, uh, customers are a little weary of using satellite capacity that's not fully redundant. Perfect. And we have one more minute left. So, so I have the last question for you also. Of course, of course absolutely. And, and, and I believe we will be in time. So uh, how much of automation level is happening during, again, those operations? And uh, what role can artificial intelligence, um, you know, play to help make it more autonomous? Well, uh, everything we do is, is autonomous. What we have is hold points so that can, we can recalibrate, recalibrate mm -hmm. and, and verify that we're at the right position. So if you ever watch one of our videos, I mean, our docking operation takes days. I think it's a total of about 14 days of proximity operations. And we have a number of holds, uh, far hold, near hold. Uh, and most of those are just to recalibrate and make sure that all the measurements are correct before we move to the next position. Uh, for artificial intelligence, as long as it's doing the same thing, it's still gonna be, you're gonna want to calibrate and make sure you're in the right place uh, in the spacecraft, you don't want to just let's say poke a hole in the middle of a satellite or in the especially with the with the assets of that price, right? So. Of high valued assets, no, you do not want to do that. So you need to come into different hold positions and recalibrate and make sure you're at the right position uh, before. And that's why we use a mixture of 
type of sensors and cameras to make sure we calibrate that we are where we are. And if you look back to some of our operations of MEV1, uh, there's a number of times we came in, calibrated and come out, and we'll do the same thing. We'll go in and do some calibrations before docking and then move back out and move back in. That way we make sure we're double checking everything. We're, we're dealing with very valuable assets with, um, I think, uh, Intelsat 1002 had 18 million users on that mm -hmm. spacecraft. And we docked to it in orbit during operation. And not one of those 18 million customers called in and said they were having troubles with the satellite communication. So it was great. Intelsat's uh, help center, help Talk desk. Talk about the social proof, right? Up. <laughs> exactly. That's what's very important is to dock as you promised and not disrupt service. And so that's what we've gained in five years of operation is those type of operations. And, and that's just the beginning again, as you're emphasizing. As and well. that's just the beginning. And it was very important to do things, whether you're around Earth's orbit, the moon's orbit or Mars orbit, it's going to be the same operations that's needed. And so right now we're using, we give a command to move forward to the next docking, you know, next hold station. Um, but it, the spacecrafts are doing all that work themselves. So artificial intelligence is very important at Northrop Grumman. I'm not sure how it's going to be implemented with space logistics, but we will adapt and adopt it as part of our services, of course. Perfect. So thank you so much again, Thomas, for the Absolutely. presentation and for answering all the questions again with a lot of great insights and uh, for attendees, so they will be able to connect with you, uh, Thomas, to to reach out to you to you know uh, request even private one on one networking sessions as well with you, Absolutely. either the ones that are attending live currently or if if you are watching this on demand uh, as a recording, uh, please make sure to do so with Thomas to explore again the refueling, not refueling, but the life extension and recycling services for you. Absolutely, Nick. Absolutely. Uh, feel free to give out my Northrop Grumman email address, and the more than welcome. I uh, I grant you one thousand questions, Nick. Of course, you can, can. You can. You've only used up about four or five today, but you still have a, close to a thousand questions to me. So just keep hitting me with more questions. You Perfect. can. See I'm very enthusiastic about us yes. extending the life of satellites and not causing debris up there. And I wish I had a good answer for Leo, but I don't. I don't know the answer for that. <laughs>